Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible 2 series, uh, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And uh, so, again, welcome. I'm so glad that you're with us. We are in Isaiah, because we are doing our normal, our customary uh, plan that when we finish a book, we're, we we uh, go over to Isaiah, read a few, a couple passages out of there. And uh, so we just finished the Gospel of Luke, in case you're wondering. And uh, we're going to open up here in Isaiah 62. I've looked ahead and I didn't find anything that needed to be highlighted out. Um, because, again, we don't know if you have little listening ears with you. And um, sometimes uh, subjects come up that are difficult for little ones to hear. And uh, so we, of course, leave that to you to handle how you wish or whoever you're ministering, however you feel that your heart is right to do. And uh, let's go ahead and pray and we'll, and we'll jump in. Father. I thank you once again for the book of Isaiah. I thank you that it gives us great insight into uh, your plan through Jesus and uh, your plan even after what Jesus uh, came to do uh, has been accomplished. And I thank you uh, that you'll give us uh, wisdom and insight as we read in the word together because you do want us to understand these things. And so uh, help us to meditate upon these things and to ponder these things and to talk to you about them and even sing to you about them and uh, just let it get down into our heart the same way that a seed gets deep down into the ground. And uh, let our help us to have our roots grow deep down into Jesus himself, who is uh, the author and the finisher of our faith and the author of life, as the word calls him. And so I thank you for these things. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Okay, Isaiah 62. So God is speaking here about specifically about uh, Jerusalem. He also calls Jerusalem Zion. And so he has his own... Uh, names that he refers to that city by. That city is uh, still a city that exists in modern day. The city of Jerusalem is um, central to a lot of the things that transpire in the earth because, yes, we certainly have the church that God has sent out into all the earth to preach the gospel, but the word says he has not forsaken his people, Israel, either. Even And he wants them to accept Jesus as a whole, and he prophesies that there's a time that they will. In other words, enough of that nation will, that God will consider it as uh, that the nation has turned back to him. And of course, everyone still has their free will. There might be those of Jewish descent who refuse to accept Jesus, but uh, we'll leave that between them and God. And so here it is, verse 1, Isaiah 62. This is God speaking. Because I love Zion, I will not keep still, because my heart yearns for Jerusalem. I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until her righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like a burning torch. And so actually, I was mistaken. That's not, that's, that was looking at the wrong uh, point of view. That's, that's Isaiah himself talking about these things. So my apologies. And so verse 2, The nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory. And you will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. The Lord will hold you in his hand for all to see, a splendid crown in the hand of God. Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the or desolate land, the desolate land, excuse me. Your new name will be the city of God's delight and the bride of God. For the Lord delights in you and will claim you as his bride. Your children will commit themselves to you, uh, O Jerusalem, just as a young man commits himself to his bride. Then God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. And, you know, um, I love this because it, it, the, the scripture just confirms scripture. It, it's, it's all tied in together. It, there's so many connection points in scripture that I don't know that you could count them all. And so um, in the book of Revelation, uh, the angel is talking to John and says, I'll, come on, I'm going to show you the bride, uh, the bride of, of the Lamb. And so he, he takes him and he sees the city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And so what that is then is that is God is it's the fullness of God of this prophecy, really, where God is going to uh, have he's going to he's Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem and Jerusalem is symbolized as the bride of Christ. And so the church is also symbolized as the bride of Christ. Jesus was talking to the crowds, and he told them they were of Jewish crowds. He said, "You, if you hear what I'm having to say, then you are my sheep." And he says, "I have other sheep, uh, too, that are not of this sheepfold. Them too, I must bring, and the and the two will be united into one flock." And so, what is that? That's the church. Okay, 
that's Jewish, Jewish Gentiles or Jewish believers, Gentile believers uh, who have put their faith in Jesus coming together as his church. Well, the church is also likened to the bride of Christ. And so is the city of Jerusalem. And so then you have this uh, completion or, or, or um, uniting, if you will, of what God has, uh, what God has envisioned to be a people who love him and care for him greatly. And so, uh, verse 6, So, O Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night continually. Take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. <laughs> okay. Give the Lord no rest until he completes his work, until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. The Lord has sworn to Jerusalem by his own strength, I will never again hand you over to your enemies. And so, here we go. Um, there's other places in the Bible where watchmen are used as symbols, but also he said, I've posted watchmen on your walls. They'll pray day and night continually. And then he's saying to the watchmen, take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. So take no rest in prayer to the watchmen who have been posted. And he says, give the Lord no rest until he completes his work. People a lot of times are like, well, how come prayer is not being answered? Wait, I, I've been asking God for this, and why is prayer not being answered? God is working. His work is not yet complete. And so he said, so you remember uh, Jesus was talking about prayer, and he was telling them, because he said, well, tell us how to pray. And he gave them uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't supposed to be a formula that we memorized, but rather it's con in, uh, contained within that prayer are principles that we are to abide by while we are praying. And, but then Jesus went further and was talking about um, praying and never giving up. And he used that analogy of, you know, uh, say, you, you know, you have a friend who's gone to bed and you have a visitor that showed up and you need to feed them and you have no bread. So you go to your friend's house and you're knocking on the door, knocking on the door. And he says, please go away. Me and my family are in bed for the night. And I can't help you. But Jesus said for, uh, he, he won't open the door for friendship's sake, but for persistence sake, if you if you keep on this shameless persistence of knocking on the door, eventually he will get get up and give you whatever you're asking for just because of your shameless persistence. And in the same way, Jesus said, therefore, keep praying and don't give up. Keep asking God. And so when you're doing that, what you're actually doing is you are imploring God to continue in his work because he said here give, in verse seven, give the Lord no rest until he completes his work. How do we do that? How do we give the Lord no rest? Through prayer and continually asking him and staying in belief while we ask him because we believe he's going to do it. We believe he's going to complete his work. So in other words, we're not saying that if we haven't seen the answer to prayer right away, we're not saying, well, I guess God didn't do it. No, we, are, we should be saying we know, God, that you are working and that you are uh, bringing your work unto completion, and we are praying, just like you said, and giving you no rest until you finally complete that work that you are already doing on our behalf. And so you can say my prayers have been answered by the Lord because he is already working on it. I just have not seen the completion of the work yet, and so I will continue in prayer, and I will be persistent in my faith. Amen. So, uh, verse Let's see, uh, I guess let's just go to verse 8. The Lord has sworn to Jerusalem by his own strength, I will never again hand you over to your enemies. Never again will foreign warriors come and take away your grain and new wine. You raise the grain, and you will eat it, praising the Lord. Within the courtyards of the temple, you yourselves will drink the wine you have pressed. Go out through the gates. Prepare the highway for my people to return. Smooth out the road. Pull out the boulders. Raise a flag for all the nations to see. The Lord has sent this message to every land. Tell the people of Israel, look, your Savior is coming. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. They will be called the holy people and the people redeemed by the Lord. And Jerusalem will be known as the desirable place and the city no longer forsaken. Hmm. Chapter 63. Who is this who comes from Edom, from the city of Basra, with his clothing stained red? Who is this in royal robes, marching in his great strength? It is I, the Lord, announcing your salvation. It is I, the Lord, who has the power to save. Why are your clothes so red, as if you had been treading out grapes? I have been treading the winepress alone. No one was there to help me. In my anger I have trampled my enemies as if they were grapes. 
In my fury I have trampled my foes, their blood has stained my clothes. For the time has come for me to avenge my people, to ransom them from their oppressors. I was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So I myself stepped in to save them with my strong arm, and my wrath sustained me. I crushed the nations in my anger, and made them stagger and fall to the ground, spilling their blood upon the earth. And so, um, you know, in this particular case, and maybe I should have highlighted that out, I apologize if, um, you know, if that... Um, if that was uh, hard to hear. But so anyway, so this again, this is a picture of Jesus. And so it, he's, he, why? Well, because he's in royal robes, first of all, Jesus is the king. His uh, clothing is stained red. In this case, it's not uh, stained red with his, with, uh, with the blood that he shed on Calvary, but this is on the other side of it. It is his enemies. And we know he triumphed over Satan and all of his, his cohorts on the cross. And uh, so, some might say that this is, you can liken this to the grapes of wrath that we see in the book of Revelation. And uh, so this is uh, the vengeance that is played out against God's enemies, those who have chosen to reject Jesus, to reject the Messiah. And so it's not just them, it's also uh, the the influencing force behind them, which was Satan, because Anyone who rejects Jesus, of course, is going to be influenced by Satan. That doesn't mean that Satan chose chose for them to reject God because no one can take away their free will. They chose them themselves to, to do that. And you can liken that to what happened with um, back when the Israelites were getting ready to leave Egypt, when God was getting ready to deliver them out of Egypt, because he told them, I will judge the nation that oppresses you. But he also said, I'm going to bring judgment against their gods. And so the Bible says that any worship of any god besides the one true god is actually worship to demons. The Bible says that in, in, um, in the book of Corinthians. And so then we understand that it's not just uh, phys the, 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 the physical people who choose to um, defy God and who choose to act in hatred toward God and rejection toward God, but they have aligned themselves with Satan, who is the one who originally rejected God, and stood in rebellion. So God, so this, that's why we see this general reference to his enemies being defeated, but then also the physical enemies we can see it being defeated, the physical enemies of Jesus. And so uh, he's come to save his people. That is the, that is the announcement. I, it is I, the Lord, announcing your salvation. And so Jesus is raised up as a banner to announce the acceptable time of the Lord. And he says, I have been treading the winepress alone. No one was there to help me. And we see that in at the book of Revelation with that first writer that's revealed uh, with the first seal, the white writer that comes out uh, on the white horse, and he's, he's given a crown and he's given a bow. A bow is a symbol of a covenant. So he was given a covenant to bring, but he went out by himself. He, 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 he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, And then it says that he, but he, he wasn't given any arrows. The Bible likens arrows to people. Uh, and so we then become the arrows in his quiver. The, the word says that blessed is the man who ha whose quiver is filled with many children, many arrows. And so at the time of Jesus' initial work, he was alone, but yet he brought a covenant. And so then now that he's risen from the dead, there are many people who, who stand with him. You see that in the book of Revelation when he comes uh, with all the saints and they're with an innumerable amount on on white horses with him when he returns it's just a it's just an awesome um, understanding of what God is bringing about in the earth and so then verse 7 it says I will tell of the Lord's unfailing love I will praise the Lord for all he has done I will rejoice in his great goodness to Israel which he has granted according to his mercy and love he said they are my very own people surely they will not betray me again and he became their savior. In all their suffering, he also suffered, and he personally rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. But they rebelled against him and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he became their enemy and fought against them. Then they remembered those days of old, when Moses led his people out of Egypt. They cried out, Where is the one who brought Israel through the sea? With Moses as their shepherd. Where is the one who sent his Holy Spirit to be among his people? Where is the one whose power was displayed when Moses lifted up his hand? The one who divided the sea before them, making himself famous forever? Where is the one who led them through the bottom of the sea? 
uh, they were like fine stallions racing through the desert, never stumbling, as with cattle going down into a peaceful valley. The Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. You led your people, Lord, and gained a magnificent reputation. Look down, Lord, look down from heaven. Look from your holy, glorious home and see us. Where is the passion and the might you used to show on our behalf? Where are your mercy and compassion now? Surely you are still our father. Even if Abraham and Jacob would disown us, Lord, you would still be our father. You are a redeemer from ages past. Lord, why have you allowed us to turn from your path? Why have you given us stubborn hearts so we no longer fear you? Return and help us, for we are your servants, the tribes that are your special possession. How briefly your holy people possessed your holy place, and now our enemies have destroyed it. Sometimes it seems as though we were never we never belonged to you, as though we had never been known as your people. And so he will continue directly into chapter 64, because you've got to remember that when this was written, it wasn't separated by chapter and verse. Uh, but for the for the purposes of time, we'll go ahead and stop here. But we will say that this is a that this last part of of this chapter is that uh, prayer of desperation. You know, we've all been there where it's like, Lord, where are you? You know, and so um, God is patient with us in times like that. Um, we just need to never give up and just keep trusting in Him. And um, so, but yeah, the one part of it they're still talking about the natural possession of the land. And as far as Isaiah's understanding of it was, that was as far as it went, because I, Isaiah couldn't, couldn't see any further than that. Although Jesus did say that prophets and kings wanted to see the things that you see when he was talking to the disciples, and he was talking about his miracles and his teaching that he was bringing. He's like many of them, they wanted, they wanted insight into these things, but it was not yet the time for them to know. And so uh, this natural, uh, physical land of Israel that Isaiah is talking about is certainly a part of God's plan. But it is not the whole the whole picture. It's only in part. So he's prophesying in part here. Just as the word says in the New Testament, we know in part, we prophesy in part. It's not time for us to know fully yet, but the time is coming and it will happen. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness and mercy. I thank you, Father, that you did uh, show us things to come because you care about uh, where we are. You do care about us in our distress and you are with us when we are in trouble. And I thank you for your continuing presence. I thank you for your way out that you always provide. And I thank you for your son, Jesus, who is himself the way to have peace with you. And I thank you for that. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys. And we will see you again.